والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome you to this glorious gathering insha'Allah and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to encompass us with his mercy and blessings and to grant us the encompassing of his angels' wings we ask Allah to save us from hellfire to grant us paradise and to forgive our sins in this wonderful gathering. Today, insha'Allah, we have dedicated, dedicated this session to speak about the women of paradise. And the women of paradise, I don't mean describing the women who are in paradise. We're not up to that yet. That will be next week, insha'Allah, and the weeks after, on the descriptions of paradise. But here we are describing the types of women in this life that existed and their character who they were so that we can copy and imitate both men and women who were promised paradise by the Prophet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and some of them that were promised indirectly through the Quran and the hadiths of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who will enter paradise so there are direct and indirect specific and general but about the women insha'Allah ta'ala but before I begin I would like to recite a verse to start this wonderful gathering about the difference between this world and the hereafter and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala includes both genders the man and the woman in this particular verse describing them as the people of paradise this ayah is in these ayat are in surah al-imran and Allah says a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim زين للناس حب الشهوات من النساء والبنين والقناطير المقنطرة من الذهب والفضة والخيل المسومة والخيل المسومة والأنعام والحرف ذلك متاع الحياة الدنيا والله عنده حسن المآب قل أأنبئكم بخير من ذلكم للذين اتقوا عند ربهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها وأزواج مطهرة ورضوان من الله والله بصير بالعباد الذين يقولون ربنا إننا آمنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وقنا عذاب النار الصابرين والصادقين والقانتين والمنفقين والمستغفرين بالأسحار The meanings of these verse are as follows. Allah says, This worldly life has been decorated for the people too much. The love of desires. The love of women in relation to the men. The love of having lots of children. The love of wealth, loads and herds of wealth, of gold and silver. And lovely well-groomed horses. For us today, lovely pieces of transport, machines of transport. So we compete in these things in this world and we chase after them because of their deceiving decoration. And also land loving to take land and purchase land and grow land. Allah says, this is the temporary enjoyment of this world. But whatever is with Allah is more beautiful and is also everlasting. Because the ones here don't last and they can never be anything close to what Allah has in store. Allah then asks a question. Say, O Muhammad, do you want me to inform you of something better than all of this? 
Something better than all of it? Well, Allah says, for those who stop themselves or protect themselves from the things which anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with their Lord awaiting them will be many paradises, jannat, plural, not just one garden or two, but many, many gardens which you will own in paradise. Underneath which rivers will flow, meaning you can control your rivers. You will live in there forever, and you will have spouses in there who are purified, and a pleasure from your Lord. And Allah is all seeing of everything His servants are doing. The ones, now He describes the ones who go into paradise, the ones who say, O oh, our Lord, we have truly believed in you, so forgive us our sins and save us from hellfire. The ones who are patient, the ones who are charitable, the ones who do acts which bring them closer to Allah, the ones who are honest and truthful and loyal, and the ones who seek forgiveness from Allah in the middle of the night. So in this glorious verse, my brothers and sisters, Allah has brought to us almost, basically the whole theme of the Qur'an in just a few verses. Comparing this world to the next, don't follow it. Don't, as in, don't grovel over it. And what is in store for you in the hereafter is much more beautiful and everlasting. Then he describes a little bit of what is there. And then he tells us the types of people who will enter it. And he gives us numerous examples. In relation to the, the mentioning of men and women, specifically, in this verse, Allah has mentioned it in general. When you talk in the masculine term in the Qur'an, and you speak in general or in public, in the Arabic language, you refer to both genders. But when you specify the women, then it's only the women. But here in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifies the men and the women, because a group of people or women used to ask in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, well, what about the women? So Allah mentioned another verse, in a similar meaning, but this time saying the men and the women. Just to clarify to all of us that in the Quran it's referring to both genders. Allah says in Surah Al Ahzab, it starts off in relation to the Prophet's wives. <laughs> He speaks about the women of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi saying, and remem have remembrance of your Lord inside your homes, and recite from the verses of your Lord and the knowledge which He has brought through His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in your homes. Verily, Allah is very patient and compassionate and all-knowing. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wives are the best example for the women of all times. Allah is telling them what to do inside their homes to be among the men, women of paradise. He tells them to recite and teach the words of Allah and the message of Allah to their children and make the house atmosphere an atmosphere filled with a religious one. So what is shown on television, the mother in the house who is most often there will show her children beneficial things that bring them closer to Allah will show them beneficial things. If they are worldly, then they are beneficial. She keeps away the haram. She teaches her children to avoid the haram in their house. And she doesn't allow anything to enter it except things which are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the type of women Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recommends to be in a household. Then Allah goes by explaining the Muslims in general. إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات 
والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما If you realize, صادقين صادقات مؤمنين مؤمنات This is to both genders So Allah says Verily the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, the ones who concentrate of the men and the ones who concentrate in piety, in spirituality among the men and the women, the ones who give in charity of the men and one who give in charity of the women, the ones who fast among the men and the ones who fast among the women, the ones who guard their modesty and chastity, among the men and the ones among the women, the ones who remember Allah and mention Him a lot among the men and among the women, Allah has prepared for them a generous forgiveness and an enormous reward. Azima, a magnificent reward. So again, we have the descriptions of who will enter paradise among the men and the women. And you see, the Quran has not singled out the women and made this world or Jannah just for the men. You are both on that competition, my brothers and sisters. We are both competing, men and women. Maybe you have some separate duties, some different roles in some aspects, but we are all in the same test, but probably sitting in different seats. That's all. We're all in the same examination room. Some are sitting at the front, others at the back. Some are doing a business test, others are doing a science test. But at the end of the day, you're all after that success. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke of specific women of paradise. And he did not speak of them because Allah had created them in some you know, special family where they deserve paradise just because of the consequence that they were born in. Nor does Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa specify these women because they were related to a prophet or to a messenger or to a companion, or because Allah gave them specific you know, qualities that He didn't give to anyone else? No. Rasul Sallallahu specified these women because Allah told him, number one, and number two, it's because of the work which these women chose to do and what they chose themselves to be. It was their own effort. They earned it and they struggled. There are many of them. But I would like to begin with one before these four women. A woman who existed before the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Her name was Hajar, the wife of Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam. And the reason I want to mention her first is because at the end of the verse which I just recited, Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا Allah says, and it's never be fitting for any believing man or believing woman that if Allah and His Messenger have decreed a matter that they may have their own opinion from their own choice and whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger has surely erred a very clear erring. This, there is the example of Hajar alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam married her after Asya alayhi salam, after Sarah alayhi salam gave her as a gift to her husband Ibrahim alayhi salam to marry when he couldn't have any children. And Allah gave him a child from this woman. She was a servant of Sarah and she gifted her to him because she was very old. And Hajar alayhi salam was young. And Allah gifted him a child from her by the name of Ismail alayhi salam, another prophet. He was his only child. And, uh, and Ibrahim alayhi salam was over 80 years old. And he was actually very old. He looked old and he was old. And Allah gave him that child after he had longed for him. And he was a boy. And Allah made him a prophet. And then suddenly one day, Ibrahim alayhi salam receives a command that he has to take his wife Hajar and his only newborn son Ismail alayhi salam into the middle of a desert which we now know is Mecca 
At those days, there was nothing there. There was no water, no people, nothing. You know the story. To leave them in the middle of the desert and to return without them. Just like that. No sources, no people, no food. Leave them there and come back. And so he went on that journey. Note, Hajar salam knew nothing about it. All she knew was that they were going on a journey and they're going to come back home. But also note, my dear sisters, how she was obedient and loyal to her husband. Trust between the husband and the wife. He is a prophet of God. And she is obeying him, putting her trust and loyalty in Allah, then his, her husband. So they went. And when they reached the middle of the desert, they sat down and Ibrahim alayhi salam stood up and he started to walk back to Palestine. And he did not ask his wife to follow. So she chased after him. Ya Ibrahim, ila man tatrukana? Who are you leaving us to? There's no one with us. What are you doing? And Ibrahim alayhi salam would not reply to her. Why? Because if he replies, we'll get into a conversation. And he is afraid that his heart may lose itself. He has to fulfill the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has a plan. He just kept walking straight without looking at her. And she kept on following him. Ya Ibrahim, ila man tatrukana? Who are you leaving us to? And he would not reply. He just kept walking. Finally, Hajar alayhi salam stopped for a minute and thought. With her piety, with her righteousness, with her knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she asked one simple question. Ya Ibrahim, Allahu amaraka bihada. Is it Allah who commanded you to do this? And Ibrahim alayhi salam, still without looking at her, he replied in only one answer. He said, Naam, yes. And he kept walking. At this point, Hajar alayhi salam stopped. And she watched her husband walk away. She calmed down and she said the following words. Idhan lan yudayya'an Allah. Therefore, Allah will not let us go. Allah will not lose us. Allahu Akbar. And I want you to put yourself in that position. To us, it's an imagination. It's just a story. But imagine you are really there. And it is you. The woman who her husband is commanded to leave her right there. In the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere. There are obviously many men who can't even do what Hajar alayhi salam did. Which man can do that? We are talking about women. Which man can do that? She had the power of a hundred men at that time, at heart. She said, إِذَنْ لَيْ يُضَيِّعَنَ اللَّهِ Allah will not lose us. Such reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why would she not be one of those of paradise? This is a perfect example of her. إِذَنْ لَيْ يُضَيِّعَنَ اللَّهِ Allah will not lose us. And you know the story. She began to run between Safa and Marwa when the food ran out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them water called Ma' Zamzam. And a whole village came and lived around them. And Ismail alayhi salam grew and Hajar alayhi salam lived among these people. And they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed it for them not only to be looked after, but to also grow a whole city, a whole city, a new tribe, which never existed before. And it lasted out of her honor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored her in the Quran and honored her till today. Millions of Muslims around the world go, men and women, to carry out the ritual of a woman. One woman. What do we do? We actually hurry between Safa and Marwa. What is it? It's walking and hurrying between Safa and Marwa. Why? Just because of one woman. Now, who would you want to be honored by? The fashion industry? The media? Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Oh, men, who do you want to be honored by? Your business at work? Be promoted a little bit? Okay, be promoted. But which one do you yearn for mostly? Compare. Is there any comparison between being honored by a human, by a man, or being honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There is absolutely no comparison. And here is Hajar alayhi salam, one of the best examples, not only for the women, but for the men before the women.
Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, and this hadith came in several versions, but I narrate to you one of them. Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi reported with an authentic chain of narration that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he once drew four lines and said to his companions, do you know what these are? And they said, Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. He said, the best women of the women of paradise are Khadija bint Khuwaylid, Fatima bint Muhammad sallallahu Maryam ibn Imran, and Asya bint Muzahim, the wife of Pharaoh, radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. In another hadith, which is in Sahih Muslim, al Rasul said, "Kamula min al rijali kathirun, walam yakmul min al nisa'i illa arba." Which means, in history, in the history of the world, there passed many men who were complete in every aspect of good character. Many men came past who were complete in many aspects of good character, in all the aspects of good character. However, only four women in history were com absolutely complete in every good aspect of character. What does that mean? Some people, they misinterpreted this hadith. They thought that these women were complete, meaning they didn't have their menses. That's what they said. They didn't have their menses. That's why these were the only women who were complete. This, my dear brothers and sisters, is so far away from the truth as far as the East from the West. In fact, it makes absolutely no logical sense, nor even any Islamic sense whatsoever. The woman, therefore, is perfect if it wasn't for her menses? No. For it is Allah who created the menses in her, and it is not her choice. And if it wasn't for that, she cannot bear children. In fact, menstruation for a woman is a blessing is a blessing for the offspring to come. However, what it means is <laughs> completed meaning in character. Character has various aspects, patience, loyalty, honesty, integrity, and so on and so forth. There are thousands of aspects of good character. He said, there were many men who came that fulfilled in completeness all the aspects of good character. They were perfect in loyalty, they were perfect in honesty, perfect in integrity. Perfect in, all, in bravery, perfect in righteousness, perfect in all these ways. But only four women in history were perfect in all the aspects of good character. You mention piety, they were on top, the best. You mention righteousness, they were the best. Honesty, they were the best. Loyalty, they were the best. Integrity, they were the best. Courage and bravery, they were the best. They were the best in all the aspects of character. And then he said, Khadija radiallahu anha, Maryam, Ibn to Imran, Asya, the wife of Pharaoh, and Fatima to Zahra, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let us now have a look, just briefly, at each one of their lives to see what is it that made them so important and the best in character. And I have, I can only briefly mention a little bit of each one. Because words cannot, wallahi, cannot do justice for these great women, who are the greatest example for men and women together. By the way, Maryam السلام, and Khadija anha, are actually the best among the four. Imam al-Bukhari narrated from Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu, that the Prophet وسلم, said, the best of its women is Maryam and the best of its women is Khadija. Anhum Let us begin with Maryam ibn Imran السلام. Maryam السلام, is the first lady. That's what Maryam means. The best of all women. Al Tabarani reported from Jabir that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The leaders after Maryam bint Imran of the women of paradise will be Fatima, Khadija, and Asya, the wife of the Pharaoh. So they come after Maryam Alayhi Salam even. Allahu Akbar, what kind of a woman was she? 
The reason why Maryam السلام, is considered the best of all these women is clearly stated in the Quran. Allah says, Behold, the angel said, Ya Maryam, Inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nisa'il alameen. Surah Al Imran, which means, Behold, the angel said, O Maryam, Allah has chosen you and purified you and preferred you above the women of all nations. She had a particular character in her, which she practiced to perfection. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have chosen you based on this character, purified you based on this character, purified her in her heart, in a spiritual form, in her qualities, in her character, in her mind, in her tongue, purified her in all aspects. And Allah says in the Quran, فَتَقَبَّلَهَا رَبُّهَا بِقَبُولٍ حَسَنٍ Allah said, And so your Lord accepted Maryam alayha salam with a goodly acceptance and made her to grow in a good manner. Her, her mother, when she gave birth to her, she said, Oh my Lord, accept my daughter in a goodly acceptance. And so Allah said, Your Lord therefore accepted her in a goodly acceptance. From the beginning, Maryam alayha salam was brought up in righteousness. And she was brought up under the guardianship of Zakaria alayhi salam, who was also a messenger of God. He raised her and taught her. There were several other religions. She knew them, but she chose not to go by them. For she was a Hanifiya, meaning one, a monotheist, one who worshipped Allah alone. And Maryam alayhi salam, the daughter of Imran, Allah says, whose body was chaste, so we breathe therein something of our spirit. And she put faith in the words of her Lord and his scriptures. And she was of the obedient. You can see now the qualities in her. She was obedient. This is a choice that people make, my brothers and sisters. Allah doesn't create you obedient. Allah commands us to be obedient and advises us. But it is up to our own whims and desires to see if we follow them. Or up to our own conscience to see if we are going to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead. He said she put her faith in the words of Allah. Allah said something, she trusted them. She obeyed him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in here I'd like to clarify something. What does it mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put something of his spirit or our spirit in her? The Christians use this as a refutation that we say that there is no particular Holy Spirit. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in various other verses has defined who the spirit is. He says, the spirit of ours is Jibreel alayhi salam. And the soul which Allah created and put into Maryam alayhi salam was a special soul, another spirit, which is the spirit of, Musa, of, of Isa alayhi salam. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. As though Allah has created Isa alayhi salam from a special soul. We all have spirits. We all have souls. Adam alayhi salam had a spirit. And Allah refutes any person who says, that the spirit of Isa alayhi salam is something that is divine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if anyone had that special quality, it would have been Adam alayhi salam. He created him from soil and he said to him, be, and he was. And similar thing happened to Isa alayhi salam. He created for him a soul and he said, be, and he was without a father. Maryam alayhi salam carried him and was pregnant without a father. What happened to her? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls and speaks about Maryam alayhi salam in the Quran saying she was a devout woman, an obedient woman, a chaste woman. She stayed away from all impurities and she was known to be the worshipper of that area. And she used to stay inside of the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being taught by Zakaria alayhi salam, who, as we said, took her as a, in his guardianship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about a specific moment of Maryam alayhi salam. He says, when Zakaria alayhi salam entered upon Maryam in her mihrab, he says, كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا زَكَرِيَّ الْمِحْرَابِ Every time Zakaria alayhi salam entered the monastery where Maryam alayhi salam was there worshipping her Lord and remembering him, وَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا رِزْقًا He found with her a special provision. What's that rizq? In the tafsir it says, that she would receive the fruits and vegetables of the winter when it was summer. 
and she would receive the fruits and vegetables of the summer when it was winter. Now in our days, it's, it's a bit difficult to understand because we have transportation now. So countries from different uh, seasons can send us their fruits and vegetables. But when you are living in a time where there is no such technology, how is it possible that you will receive food of the winter in summer and food of the summer in winter? This is impossible in those days. Impossible. We're talking about decades of thousands of years. And what was her reply? قالت, this provision is from Allah. Mothers should teach their children that all the provision they have in their house that it is from Allah that He provided it. And explain to them how Allah provided it. If it wasn't for Allah creating the rain, we would not have vegetation, son or daughter. And so Allah provided us with it. If it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to order the earth to grow these crops, we wouldn't have not had these crops and vegetation. So let us thank Allah for what He has provided us. And Maryam alayhi salam is the first among those examples. No one had superseded her among the women to say, Huwa min indillah. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so she carried the baby. And she went afar east, as you know. And she gave birth to her child. At that moment when the pangs of labor came to her, what would you do? What would a woman do in these days who was noble and chaste and, everybody, and she has a perfect reputation? She is now pregnant. Who is going to believe her? Who is going to believe her that she did not commit fornication or adultery? She is not married. She comes from a noble family. Who is going to believe her? They're going to say this is outrageous and imagination. Imagine a woman coming today and says, I'm pregnant because God willed it for me. I'm not married and I've never fornicated. You'd say this is absurd. Take yourself to there. That time. What was she going to do? Allah tested her with something enormous. To the point where she said beneath the palm tree, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasyam man siya. I wish that I would have died before this day and forgotten. The scholars say a person is allowed to wish for death if it is out of piety to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning to say, Oh Allah, make me die if death is better for me for my religion. She was afraid for her deen for her piety, for her religion, alayhi salam. And we know the story. Isa alayhi salam called from beneath her, saying, don't be saddened, my mother. Shake the trunk of the palm tree, and dates will fall upon you. Maryam alayhi salam is an example here, telling us, for the women and the men, that Allah will not provide you unless you work towards it a little bit. How can a woman giving in labor shake the trunk of a palm tree? Can you shake the trunk of a palm tree and make dates fall down? Not even an elephant can do it. She is in labor and he says to her, shake the trunk of the palm tree. Not only that, the tree was dry. It's dead. How are dates going to fall anyway? How are dates going to be on it? But she, even in that situation, she had to do some effort. So she touched the trunk of the palm tree and fresh dates fell upon her. He says, فَكُلِي وَشْرَبِي وَقَرِّ عَيْنًا Eat and drink and enjoy. فَإِمَّا تَرَيِّنَّ مِنَ الْبَشَرِ أَحَدٍ If you see anybody, say, I have vowed fasting to my Lord. Don't say anything, don't speak. In those days, fasting also meant not speaking. So she approached her people and the baby was in her arms. And they said to her, what did they say to her? Ya Maryam, O oh Maryam, لَقَدْ جِئْتِ شَيْئًا فَرِيَّا You have brought something outrageous. And then they said, Ya أُخْتَ هَارُونَ مَا كَانَ أَبُوكِ امْرَأَ سَوْءٍ وَمَا كَانَتْ أُمُّكِ بَغِيَّا Oh, daughter, oh, oh the, the, the sister of Aaron, meaning Harun alayhi salam was a noble man. Oh, the one who is the likeness of a prophet. So they acknowledge that. Your father wasn't a dirty man. And your mother was not unchaste. She wasn't also a dirty woman. What are they saying? 
they are saying, accusing Maryam السلام, of being a dirty and wicked woman. Accusation. What are you supposed to do? She was patient. فأشارت إليه. She pointed to her baby. And Isa alayhi salam responded while he was a baby in the cradle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected her. What is the moral here? Maryam alayhi salam put her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She could have resorted to an abortion. How did they do abortions those days? Yes, they knew. She could have thrown herself off a tree. This was the primitive way of getting an abortion. Some people in primitive countries today still do that today. Women who are impregnated, they, fought, they throw themselves off a branch and they lose the child. She could have run away. She could have killed herself. For a noble woman like that, she could have done any of that. But no, she trusted in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and returned to face the people. Why? Only because of one thing. It's obvious. Everyone's going to say, well, it's obvious. Allah was on her side. Exactly. How many of us today have that strong connection with Allah that we can say, Allah is on my side? And so we face the truth. How many? When it comes down to the crunch, how many of us will really stand firm? This is an example of one who stood in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in piety. Maryam alayhi salam. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam said she was among the perfect women. And she will be the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in paradise. The second woman that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam spoke about was his own beloved wife, his first wife Khadija radiyallahu anha. Khadija bint Khuwailid. Khadija radiyallahu anha, you all know her story. At a time when this noble man, at the age of 25 years old, before he was a prophet, she was a woman of absolute nobility. The most honorable and wealthy men of the city asked for her hand in marriage. She refused them. She had been married before, yes, to only the most noble of men, and they all died. And so she was honored among all the men even before Islam. They used to call her the noble woman, the honest woman, the loyal woman, the pure woman, even in Jahiliya. She was a very successful tradeswoman as well. And the men respected her because when she traded, she traded with modesty and with chastity. She didn't mix with men even before Islam in a wrong way. So they respected her immensely. No one spoke about her badly. And this is almost similar to the way Muhammad وسلم, was known before he became a prophet. A man of nobility, a man of honesty, a man of loyalty. Very similar in characteristics, subhanAllah. And no one had this characteristic except for Khadija radiallahu anha among all the women. How close in resemblance in her character to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa even before Islam. Something special about this woman. Obviously the mind and the intellect and the choices the human makes. Allah has given us the ability to choose right and wrong. And she was among those. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa came to ask for her hand in marriage. He was 25, she was 40. Age doesn't matter when noble characteristics are present. Al Rasul sallallahu said, and among the best paradises, the meaning of the hadith, and among, and among the best living, as though you are living in paradise, in this life is a noble woman, a wife, that when you look at her, she pleases you. Meaning her character, her smile, her talk, her living with you pleases you. He said she is like a paradise. And so Khadija radiallahu anha was the paradise of Muhammad sallallahu on this earth. When the Prophet sallallahu received the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know the story. People were already thinking, what does, the mess what does Muhammad sallallahu do up in the cave of Hira? What is he doing up there? He would spend weeks after weeks, days after days. And Khadija radiallahu anha, she did not walk away. Saying, why don't you give me time? Why don't you spend time with me? You neglect me. She knew who her man was. And she knew there was something full of wisdom. For listen to what she said to him. When he came to her on that day 
when Jibreel alayhi salam bestowed himself and everywhere the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam would look in the sky, he could see Jibreel alayhi salam. He covered the sky and no one else could see it. Until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam thought of himself, I am possessed. What is wrong with me? Has God willed something bad for me? He entered the house of his wife Khadija radiallahu anha. Yes, it was her house. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi salam used to trade on her behalf as well. And he entered her house, which she shared with him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, she wasn't one of those women who says, this is my house, and I can say to you, you can leave whenever I say so. No. She said, this is our house, and I am loyal to you, my husband. He entered and he was shaking and shivering, confused. He lied down on the ground and he embraced himself as though he had no one else to hold on to. And he said the following words, Sammiluni, please embrace me with a blanket, cover me, cover me up. It's cold and shivering, pale. Khadija radiallahu anha raced with a blanket and covered him up. And she embraced him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu Akbar. This is usually what a husband does to his wife, to protect him. But this time, Ar Rasul sallallahu required protection. For something had happened to him that no human being can bear, wallahi. She embraced him radiallahu anha and she's calmed him down. And he said, I fear ya Khadija. She was the only one he can turn to. I fear ya Khadija that I am possessed. Something Allah has willed for me. And you know what she said to him? There was no one who could say these words out of anyone in the tribe except for Khadija radiallahu In fact, in the whole world. She said, in firm words and in strong words, Ya Muhammad, sallallahu alayka, Ya Rasulullah, my husband, how can you say this? Wallahi la yukhzik Allah, wallahi by God, Allah will never betray you. Anta tut'amul miskeen, you feed the poor people. Wa tu'wil yateem, and you are the one who embraces and gives shelter to the orphans. وَتَصِلُ الْأَرْحَامِ And you are the one who connects between families. And you are the one who reconciles between people. Allah will never betray you. Be patient, my husband. This is a wisdom and a new beginning from your Lord. Allahu Akbar, ya akhwan. I want you to live this moment just for a minute over here. Here is a man who has entered his house, who has come with the most unbelievable thing. He says, I have seen this th and I have seen that and I have received this. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And even himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is thinking what has happened. Khadija radiallahu anha makes him firm. Khadija radiallahu anha believes in him. Khadija radiallahu anha, she invites the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself to accept what has come to him of message from Allah. It was as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent Khadija radiallahu anha to be the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 50,000 years before the creation of the universe. For this moment. If Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not have Khadija there sent by Allah, who would give him that strength? It was Allah who gave him that strength. And he sent Khadija radiallahu anha as a means to make her an example for all of us. For the women who come later on. Khadija radiallahu anha protected the Prophet sallallahu How did she protect him? Not with physical force. No. She protected his moral being. She protected him in his heart. She protected him by being his moral support by his side, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. She never, wallahi, one day said to anyone or even made it sound to the Prophet sallallahu that look, you know, it seems that we're going to have to go our separate ways. He, she never called him a madman, a lunatic, one who is stri Wallahi, she never said this in his life. But rather she said, you are a wise man who has been given an enormous message. And she took him to her uncle, who was a wise man who knew the scriptures. And he said, Waraq ibn Nawfar. He said to him, you innahu namus The one whom you are seeing in the sky is Jibreel alayhi salam. And namus which was mentioned in the Bible. He said, and if I were to live to the day when your people drive you out of your land, 
I will wallahi be among the first to support you. But he died before the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned him. And our scholars tell us that he was among those who lived before Jahiliya who would go to paradise. Khadija radiallahu anha stood by his side all the way, my brothers and sisters. She went with him on three years of hunger. She took the beatings, meaning the words of the people. She lived with him and said, I will be with you through every hard and through every ease. Radiallahu anha. Khadija radiallahu anha. And for that, one day, Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu and said to him, O Messenger of God, your wife is about to come to you carrying some wood. Soon, she's about to come to you. I have come to you with a message from your Lord, from above seven heavens. When she comes to you, inform, inform her the following message from Allah. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a wahi. When she comes to you, say to her that Allah, her Lord, loves her. He is pleased with her. And give her good news that Allah has prepared for her a palace in paradise made of pipes of the most precious pearls and stones in there, in paradise, where she will have no more hardship and she will have no more hearing of harsh words. So Khadija radiallahu anha approached and the Prophet had a smile from his ear to ear, smiling. And he said to her, and she said to him, Yara, yeah, my dear beloved husband, what is it? He said to her, I have the best news for you, my dear wife. Allah has sent a message to you through the wahi that you, that he is pleased with you and you have a house built specially for you in Jannah. What did Khadija radiallahu anha reply? She said, O messenger of God, and I love my Lord. I love my Lord. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, who is this woman? Allahu Akbar. And what was her aim and objective in life? It was Wallahi, Allah and paradise. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never married another woman in her lifetime. Who would possibly do so? And Khadija radiallahu anha died at a moment when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam needed her the most. Why? Our scholars say, so that you will not think that it is his wife only that gave him the protection, but so that you know that it is Allah who is giving him the protection and it is Allah who sent him this noble woman for protection. And so Allah protected her. The second one, or the third one that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned is Asya bint Muzahil, the wife of Pharaoh ﷺ. Allah mentioned Asya in the Qur'an but without saying her name. In Surah At-Tahrim, Allah says about Asya radiallahu anha alayhi salam, وضرب الله مثلا للذين آمنوا امرأة فرعون وضرب الله مثلا للذين آمنوا امرأة فرعون إذ قالت رب ابن لي عندك بيتا في الجنة ونجني وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ And Allah says, the, the ayah, And Allah has given an example to those who believe, the wife of Pharaoh, when she said, O oh my Lord, build for me, build for me a house with you in your paradise, with you, close to you, and save me from Fir'aun, and his actions, and save me from the oppressive people. What kind of woman is that for Allah to mention in the Quran? Well, I'll tell you what. She is the wife of the most richest king in that day. 
Fir'aun, who had everything under his command, to the point where he said to the people, مَا عَلِمْتُ لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرِي I have not known any other God but myself for you. And this is his wife. She had all the palaces. She had everyone at her, at her feet. She only had to click her fingers and her wish was her command. She had everything. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the example of one of the, one of the queen of queens of the world who had everything that you could wish for in her time. That if she was here today, she will be the most richest and most powerful woman on the face of the earth today. She had everything that one could imagine in those days. Why is Allah giving us her as an example? To tell us that you can have everything you want in the world. And if Allah were to give it to you, it is nothing compared to what Allah has in store in paradise. So what did he say? Asya She had embraced Islam and followed the religion of Musa السلام, in secret. And when Fir'aun found out, she faced him. And she said, yes, I follow the, the, the religion of Musa السلام. So Fir'aun brought his own wife with his soldiers. And he began to torture her, whip her, make her bleed, punish her, so that she may renounce the religion of Musa السلام. But she stood firm, brothers and sisters. There is a hadith that states in narrations, that he hung her from the ceiling with chains from her breasts. That's how he would torture her. And she would cry, alayhi salam, from the pain. But then she said the following words, O oh Allah, build for me a palace with you, close to you, with you, my Lord. And Allah showed her her palace in Jannah while she was under the torture. In the narration, it says that she began to smile under the torture because Allah had shown her her palace in Jannah. And Fir'aun would question, confused, how can she smile under torture? It is Allah who has comforted her, my dear brothers and sisters. She died under that torture with a smile. And Allah placed her in Jannah close to him in a place close in paradise in Firdaus. <laughs>
he brought the intestines and the feces and he threw it on the head of Muhammad وسلم, while he was prostrating. And he stayed in his prostration, unable to get up. Fatima radiallahu anha, imagine what her feelings would be. Fatima radiallahu anha saw her father being treated in such a fashion. What could she do? A girl, not only even 10 years old. She went up to her father and removed the offensive stuff off his head. And she stood firmly and angrily before those men. And she faced them screaming to them, saying to them, how can you do this to, to, to my father? And not one of them even replied to her. And the Prophet ﷺ made a dua, O oh Lord, may you punish the Quraysh. And then he said, may you punish Utbah and Uqba, Abu Jahl and Shayba. Shortly afterwards in the battle of Badr, all of them, all of them were killed. Another occasion, Fatima radiallahu anhu was with the Prophet ﷺ as he made tawaf around the Kaaba. And a Quraysh mob gathered around him وسلم. They seized him and they tried to strangle him with his own clothes sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fatima radiallahu anha screamed again and shouted for help. What can a small girl do? And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he rushed to the scene and managed to free the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while saying, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, while saying, أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجُلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ Would you kill a man who says, My Lord is God? And far from giving up, the mob turned to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and began to beat him until you could not know the front of his face from the back because of all the blood that seeped out of him. Fatima radiallahu anha trying to protect her father at that time only as a small girl. As Fatima radiallahu anha grew older, grew older, often the trials were too much for her. And once about this time, when she was a little bit older, a mob heaped dust and dirt on the gracious head of her father, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he entered his home, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he was upset and sad. Fatima radiallahu anha wept. And as she wept and cleaned the dust off her father's head, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, Do not cry, my daughter, for God shall protect your father. He once said to Fatima radiallahu anha, Whoever pleased Fatima has indeed pleased God, and whoever has caused her to be angry has indeed angered God. Fatima is a part of me. Whatever pleases her pleases me, and whatever angers her angers me. One time Rasul sallallahu used to whatever he had of food sent to Fatima radiallahu anha and Ali, because she married him radiallahu anhu. And he brought some food to her and to his tribe. And then Fatima Radana went, used, she used to take food to her father, always. One day she brought food to her father because she was so poor, but once she grabbed hold of some food and she went to her father. And when she brought them to him, he said, what do you have, my dear daughter? She, had, she said, I have enough, father. Please take this food. And the Prophet ﷺ took a few dates and looked at his daughter and he smiled. And he said to her, your father has not eaten in three days, my daughter. This is the first time your father eats in three days. And we are here complaining about what? This is the first food your father has eaten for three days. Once Rasul returned from a journey outside of Medina and he went to the mosque and he used to visit Fatima radiallahu anha before he visited his wives. And at the time of his deathbed, he entered Aisha radiallahu anha's house and he was ill. And Fatima radiallahu anha entered and she said, Wa karba abata. Oh, the pain my father is feeling. And he said to her, La karba ala abiki ba'd al ya Fatima. There will be no harm upon your father after this day, ya Fatima. And Aisha radiallahu anha left her father, her husband, and his daughter alone. She walked away. And it was the Rasul Sallallahu used to get up of his seat and he used to kiss his daughter Fatima on her forehead and let her sit where he sits. But that day he could not get up because he was so ill. So she came up to him and she kissed him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi kissed her forehead and she began to cry. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi whispered to her two things. The first one made her cry more and the second one made her smile. Aisha radiallahu anha said, what did, she, what did he say to you? And she said, مَا كُنْتُ لِأُفْشِيَ سِرَّ الرَّسُولِ اللَّهِ I will not tell the secret of the Prophet while he is alive. And the day when the Prophet died, 
They insisted on knowing what he had said in secret to Fatima radiallahu anha. She said, the first news that he said to me was, your father will soon depart this world. So I cried. And the second news he said to me, which made me smile, he said, Ala yurdiki. Is it not pleasing to you that you will be the first among the women of my family that will follow me? And you will be among the first that will enter paradise. So she smiled. She said, I was happy that it will not be long before I die so I can meet with my father and be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was six months or five months after that when she had seen a dream. When she had seen a dream of her father. And on that day, she asked for some water and she bathed. She then asked her servant who helped her, Salma, to put her bed in the courtyard of the house, with her face looking to the heavens above. She asked for her husband, Ali, radiallahu anhu. He was taken by surprise in the back. He started to cry for his wife. When he saw her lying in the middle of the courtyard and asked her what was wrong, and she smiled and said the following words. I have an appointment today with the messenger of God. She had seen a dream that her father said to her, I have an appointment with you, O Fatima, my daughter.